Paul, uh, the museum director, Paul Spitzeri. Uh, I have the honor of being part of this Long Road to Freedom project with Jackie, uh, Sarah, and Kevin, and I'm very happy to introduce them to you. So first we'll be hearing from Kevin Waite, who is assistant professor of American history at Durham University in England. He's a co-director with Sarah of a National Endowment for the Humanities collaborative research grant on the life and times of Biddy Mason. His first book, West of Slavery, The Southern Dream of a Transcontinental Empire was published last April. West of Slavery was recently named a finalist for the Lincoln Prize and called one of the 11 books that shaped the way we think about California by Boom, a journal of California. By the way, the homestead is gonna be featuring Kevin's book as part of its book club in December. His writing has also appeared in The Atlantic, National Geographic, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and Slate. So thank you, Kevin, for joining us. We will also be hearing from uh, Jackie Broxton, who is a Los Angeles native. She serves as the executive director of the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation. The foundation was created in 2013 and provides services and support to both current and former foster youth in Los Angeles County. Educated locally in Los Angeles City Schools, Jackie developed a love of history and African American history specifically in middle school. That love has grown over the years and currently she is showing that by completing a series of six one act plays on conversations between Betty Mason and other early Los Angeles settlers. She's a 40 year member of the first AME church in Los Angeles where she has served in a variety of leadership positions. And Jackie has been recognized by the black faculty and staff of Los Angeles Community College Association for her leadership within the foster care community. She's a community outreach director for the Long Road to Feed and Project, examining the life of Biddy Mason. She is a founding member of 3FN, Faith Foster Families Network, which is an interfaith collaborative seeking to provide support to the foster community. She's the mother of one daughter, Felicia Martin Hill, the director of media and promotions for Essence Magazine, and the grandmother to two boys, Isaiah and Christian. Because of technical difficulties, which is not unexpected with Zoom, we are not going to be hearing from our third presenter today, but we do want to introduce her as a co-chair of this project. Sarah Berenger gordon is an Arlen M. Adams Professor of Constitutional Law and Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. She works on religious and legal history as well as Western expansion. Sarah is interested particularly in the law of slavery in California and the ways that race, religion, and freedom have been connected in the history of Los Angeles. Through collaboration with Kevin, uh, Jackie, and others, uh, they're working together towards a fuller and more wide-ranging understanding of the remarkable life and times of Biddy Mason and her legacy for the city she helped build, which is a great way to transition over to the talk. So I'm going to give the uh, microphone virtually over to Kevin and Jackie. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Great, uh, thanks so much, Paul, and thank you, Jenny, um, for putting this together and having us here tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with Jackie and, and with Sally and Spirit, too, uh, about the remarkable story of Biddy Mason and the grant that we're directing together. Um, Paul here gets a very extra special thank you, um, not just as the host of tonight's talk, but really as, a, as an integral member of our collaborative team. Um, if you don't know this already about Paul, uh, Paul knows more about early LA history than I think any person on the planet. Um, and he's been really instrumental in our progress on the grant. Um, I'm now going to uh, attempt to share my screen and uh, start a slideshow. So I'll just be speaking briefly for about 20 minutes or so about uh, Biddy Mason's story to sort of situate us and give us an overview. Um, and that story really begins in 1818 in Hancock County, Georgia, uh, really right at the heart of the Southern Cotton Belt. Um, now to be uh, an enslaved person anywhere in the United States was a, a pretty dismal fate, but uh, to be enslaved in this particular time and this particular place in Georgia in the early 19th century is just about uh, as bad as it got. Um, and that's because this part of the country was undergoing a, something of a cotton revolution right at the time that Biddy was first sent into the fields herself. Uh, and to meet this insati insatiable uh, global demand for cotton, American slaveholders drove uh, their human property right to the very limits of human endurance. But whereas millions of African-American slaves would work and bleed and ultimately die on the plantations of the American cotton belt, Biddy escaped this fate. 
When she was about 20 years old, she began a long, strange trip, one that would take her out of Georgia and across the continent, first to Mississippi, uh, then to Utah, and finally to Southern California and Los Angeles. She went as a slave. Uh, she was forcibly transported by her legal owner, a man by the name of Robert M. Smith. Uh, but finally, by 1856, at the age of 38, uh, Biddy won her freedom in a Los Angeles courtroom. Uh, and that's the story that I'm just going to outline, like I said, really briefly here, uh, how this enslaved woman seemingly uh, doomed to a life of hard labor and death in obscurity walked across the continent and then broke free from bondage. Uh, and not only did she win her freedom in a particularly uh, heroic fashion, I'd say, she went on to become one of the most successful businesswomen and philanthropists in the young boom town of Los Angeles, uh, first as a nurse and a midwife, uh, and then as a real estate entrepreneur and a philanthropist. Uh, Biddy Mason really, in a lot of ways, laid the foundations of Black Los Angeles. Now, uh, like the, the story of, of so many uh, formerly enslaved people, there are some uh, intrinsic difficulties about recovering this history. Uh, Biddy Mason left no records in her own hand. In fact, she was illiterate. Um, in 19th century America, it was actually illegal to teach uh, enslaved people how to read and write. Uh, and by the time she won her freedom at age 38, Biddy found that she could actually get on just fine, uh, even as a businesswoman without literacy. So to recover her life story, we really have to uh, read between the lines and against the grain of the available records. And this, I think, uh, is why, despite the remarkable uh, arc of her life story and the enduring impact of her accomplishments, there isn't really that much written about Biddy Mason. Um, uh, there was uh, some great scholarship beginning in the 1980s um, and some important works more recently. And I, I hope that you've you know, encountered at least some of this material on her life. Um, but there's also, unfortunately, uh, a lot of misinformation out there. And so um, today, I think Jackie and I will try and do our best to clear up some of this in, uh, misinformation and sort of separate fact from fiction. Now, Biddy's uh, transcontinental journey and her triumph over slavery um, intersects uh, with what may seem an unexpected history. And it really, in a lot of ways, begins with the history of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, that is, um, with Mormonism. Uh, so the LDS Church, uh, which uh, became the largest homegrown religion in American history, was founded by Joseph Smith in upstate New York in the early 1830s. And within about a decade, uh, Smith and his followers had converted tens of thousands uh, of people, including several hundred white Southerners in Mississippi, including uh, some prominent slaveholders. And Biddy's uh, legal owner, Robert Smith, no relation to Joseph, by the way, uh, was one of them. Now, uh, as the LDS faith began to grow, uh, it also began to encounter some really brutal persecution. Uh, and in 1844, Joseph Smith, uh, the prophet and founder of the church, was himself assassinated. And this prompted an exodus of the Mormon faithful beginning in 1847 to some place beyond the reach uh, of this persecution, they thought, to found uh, a separate colony in what's now Utah. Um, and Robert Smith, uh, along with Biddy and her three daughters and a woman named Hannah, and I'm, I'm really excited to announce or say that um, one of Hannah's descendants, Angela Wilkinson, is, is on this call. So I'm, I'm really excited that you're here, Angela. Anyway, um, Biddy, Hannah, uh, and a number of their children uh, were taken by Robert Smith uh, as some of the earliest settlers of frontier Utah. And so here's a, a really crucial point of, of not just this presentation, but really the, the grant as a whole. Um, and that's the road to freedom in 19th century America uh, didn't run west. Uh, Biddy, sure, had escaped backbreaking labor in the cotton fields of uh, Georgia and Mississippi, but she wasn't uh, any more free in Utah, really, than she had been in the Deep South. Uh, and in 1852, the legislature of Utah actually passed uh, a slave law to sort of solidify this fact, you know, the right to hold African-Americans in lifelong bondage 
uh, was inscribed into Utah law. Um, and here's a, a, a monument, the Brigham Young Monument in Salt Lake City, uh, which lists um, the, some of the very first pioneers uh, of Mormon Utah. And at the very bottom of this plaque, you'll uh, see the names of three enslaved men um, who are sort of euphemistically uh, named colored servants here. Now, in the, in the popular imagination, and actually in a lot of what we've been taught as Californians, the, the American West is this place of pioneering individuals, right? Uh, it's a place of, you know, to be sort of pat about it, gunslingers and saloons and cowboys and Indians and railroads and one horse towns. Um, it's the land of Clint Eastwood, um, not the land of enslaved women like Biddy. Uh, but what we're really trying to emphasize in this grant is that slavery had a transcontinental reach in mid 19th century America. And that to understand the history of the American West, you, you have to peel back this layer of gunslinger frontier mythology uh, and to study uh, the people whose stories have largely been lost, people like Biddy Mason. Now, the fact that slavery had a national reach was abundantly clear uh, to, to Biddy herself, and it became even clearer when her owner uh, forced her on yet another journey, uh, this time to San Bernardino in 1851. Now, uh, California, as a lot of you probably know, had technically outlawed slavery in 1850. It was formally uh, a free state by the time Biddy arrived in San Bernardino, but officials within California basically turned a blind eye to the institution of slavery. So uh, no officials within the state really registered any complaint when Robert Smith and others began importing enslaved laborers into San Bernardino. Uh, by the mid 1850s, Smith actually uh, owned uh, 13 women and children in addition to Biddy. Uh, and this made him uh, probably the largest slaveholder in the American West by that point. Uh, and these enslaved African Americans labored uh, alongside a number of uh, uh, Native American slaves. So, uh, in short, uh, San Bernardino was a highly prosperous you know, slave colony, you could call it, uh, hidden in plain sight on ostensibly free soil. Only in late 1855 did Robert Smith finally run afoul of the law, uh, and only because basically he attempted to take Biddy and his other enslaved workers out of California. Um, he was apprehended before he could leave the state, uh, and Biddy and uh, the others were taken into custody in Los Angeles. Um, Biddy was uh, actually initially held in the LA County Jail, supposedly for her own protection as she waited the start of her freedom suit. Um, and to give you a sense of, of the geography of the jail and the courthouse where the, where the trial took place, um, they were located you know, more or less across the street from where City Hall now stands. So uh, through no fault of her own, Biddy was uh, actually one of the earliest inmates of LA's prison system, which now incarcerates more people, many of them black, uh, like Biddy, uh, more people than any other city in the US, uh, which is one of the most heavily incarcerated countries in the world. Um, anyway, uh, I, I won't go into too much detail about the trial here because uh, I'll say a little bit more about it as I, um, uh, as I attempt to give a, a presentation from, uh, that speaks to Sally's notes. Um, but in short, uh, this was uh, the largest freedom suit in the history of the American West. Uh, by January 1856, Biddy and 13 others, including uh, her three daughters and Hannah, who I mentioned earlier, were free at last. So uh, there we have it. Uh, Biddy is finally a free woman in Los Angeles in 1856. But uh, aside from her freedom, she didn't really have anything to her name. Uh, she couldn't read, uh, she couldn't write, she had no property, uh, and she had her three young daughters to look after. Uh, in fact, Biddy at this point didn't even have a last name. So uh, now that she was free, she took the last name Mason. Now, uh, some scholars have claimed that uh, this uh, name Mason was actually an homage to a, um, to a Mormon uh, elder named uh, Amasa Mason Lyman, 
Um, but in my opinion, there's literally uh, no real reason why Biddy would feel any affinity uh, to a man who actually oversaw the colony of San Bernardino where she labored in slavery for about five years. Um, and even if she did have an affinity for uh, this, this man Lyman, um, it seems really odd that she would take his middle name. Um, most likely, I think, uh, Mason was a name with significance to her long lost uh, family in Georgia. Um, basically, uh, it was a way uh, to reach across time and space, at least symbolically, um, to connect with the people from whom she'd been torn decades ago. Now, once again, um, Biddy's story takes this wildly unpredictable turn. Um, so shortly after winning her freedom, she was hired by a, a former slaveholder, a doctor named John S. Griffin, as a nurse and a midwife in his medical practice. My slides are having a little trouble. Jackie, can you see the slides all right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and uh, from the money that she earned as a nurse and a midwife in John S. Griffin's medical practice, Biddy began to build her fortune. Uh, it took uh, 10 years of hard work and saving, but she eventually acquired her first property, uh, a pretty spacious homestead on Spring Street. Um, and by the way, that's where um, the Biddy Mason Memorial Wall now stands, um, more or less on the property that, that Biddy owned. And, and I hope a lot of you have seen, uh, had an opportunity to see it. It's really moving. Uh, and from that property, uh, from that first purchase uh, of her Spring Street lot, she bought another and another and then another. Um, and this was all land basically right at the heart of today's downtown LA. Um, we're in the process of sort of piecing together um, her real estate portfolio. Again, the records here are really thin. Uh, we have some help from her, her will, um, but we think that Biddy owned land on, on which some of LA's most iconic buildings now stand. And in total, uh, she accumulated tens of thousands of dollars in property. Um, that money uh, ended up seeding a family fortune that was estimated at about $300,000, which is give or take 8.5 million in, in today's currency uh, by the turn of the century. That was the family fortune. Um, now, this was a huge sum of money for anyone at the time, but it was a completely unprecedented fortune um, for someone who was basically the dual target of discrimination, not only as a woman, uh, but as a Black woman and a former slave. And Mason uh, plowed most of this fortune into, or quite a bit, I should say, of this fortune into charity and philanthropy. Uh, she gave to school, she visited prisons, um, and crucially, she supported other members of LA's fast-growing uh, Black community. In 1872, uh, she co-founded the First Black Church of Los Angeles, First African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, and she actually held the first meetings in her own uh, front parlor. And as a, as a lot of you will know, and Jackie knows as well as anyone, uh, fame remains a major institution in Los Angeles to this very day. So in a lot of ways, uh, Biddy Mason's life story is really the origin story of Los Angeles. Um, and so just to give you a, a sense for how LA was transformed during her time there, uh, this is uh, the city uh, more or less when she arrived in 1856, really a one horse town uh, of dirt roads and um, timber structures and adobe structures, all more or less all one story, narrow dirt roads. Um, more or less, that's what it looked like when she arrived. Um, uh, and this uh, is uh, what LA looked like by the time of her death in 1891. Uh, and really, thanks in part to her pioneering vision, Los Angeles would boast the highest proportion of Black homeowners of any city in the country by the early 20th century. And in everything she did, Mason embodied her own personal motto, quote, if you hold your hand closed, nothing good can come in. The open hand is blessed for it gives in abundance even as it receives. Uh, and that very, very briefly is, uh, is the story of Biddy Mason. Um, 
Jackie, unless you'd like to jump in, um, or Paul or Jenny, I could um, I can very quickly run through um, uh, some of Sally's slides um, to try and give sort of a richer sense of, uh, of Biddy's life and, and accomplishments. Um, so Sally was going to speak to um, uh, the the freedom suit um, in 1856, in which Biddy won her freedom and 13 others won her freedom. Um, she was going to speak to some of her community work, um, and she was going to speak to sort of her role uh, as a matriarch uh, of a leading Black family in Los Angeles. Um, and the, I, I, I could go on all night about the suit uh, that brought freedom to Biddy. I mean, it's a, you, you, a, a screenwriter couldn't write this any more dramatically. Um, and just really briefly, um, uh, even though uh, California was a free state at the time, uh, really the law was not on Biddy's side. Legal precedent uh, had actually dictated that a judge like Benjamin Hayes, who himself was a slaveholder, probably should have ruled against the freedom claims uh, of Biddy and Hannah and the others. Um, uh, the, the California Supreme Court ruled in a somewhat similar case against the freedom claims uh, of three Black men just three years earlier. And that was in a lot of ways the legal precedent upon which Hayes could have drawn. Um, he didn't. Uh, and uh, fortunately so, and by January 1856, um, the uh, largest freedom suit in the history of the West was decided in favor of the enslaved. Um, this is a slide, uh, this is actually an image that's currently on display in Los Angeles right now. I think Jackie's going to go see it tomorrow. I wish I could. I'm in London, unfortunately, um, uh, by the artist Elizabeth Columba. Uh, really a beautiful, um, beautiful painting of Biddy. Um, it just goes to show that Biddy's story resonates today. It resonates with artists and creators and writers, um, even if we feel as if the full account of her life hasn't yet been written. Um, this is a, a mural um, that's uh, 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 prominent in, in Fame Church. Um, uh, the church, it, it's not the same structure that, that Biddy endowed for the church, but um, this is the, the church that in a lot of ways carries on her legacy today. Um, and you can see Biddy, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but you can see Biddy in the bottom right hand corner of this big, beautiful mural um, right in the center of the church. Uh, this is this is one of the I think um, most important photos that we have of Biddy. Actually, I'm going to um, go back to an earlier slide which shows the photo in slightly larger form. Um, uh, it's in uh, the collections of UCLA, uh, and on the porch we see um, some of the women of the extended Biddy Mason family. Um, uh, this woman here has been identified as Biddy Mason, but I actually think it's this woman here. Um, if you look closely at the other uh, um, uh, photo of Biddy from around this period, uh, this woman shares uh, more features with that photo. And uh, it makes sense that this might be Biddy herself because, uh, Jackie, can you see my cursor as I'm? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Um, it makes sense that this woman would be Biddy here because she's holding her grandson, um, Robert Curry Owens. And, and as this slide said, uh, Owens would inherit um, Mason's fortune um, and he would go on to become the wealthiest black man, it was said, west of Chicago. Um, and so Biddy's, uh, one of Biddy's great accomplishments in freedom was building and holding together um, this extended uh, family as a matriarch, really a, a black uh, business dynasty that continues to this day. Um, and uh, uh, Biddy, I think, in a, in a lot of family was so important to her because it was something that she couldn't uh, retain in slavery. She was forcibly separated from her own family in Georgia and sold to Mississippi as a very young woman. Um, and so in freedom, family is what she could hold dear um, and family is, is what she built next to her own um, business empire. I think there's one more slide from Sally. Um, Biddy also crossed the color line with remarkable ease in Los Angeles in the um, mid 19th century. Um, so it was said that she had a friendship 
uh, with Pio Pico, uh, the last Mexican governor of California. Um, and uh, she built a, a thriving nursing practice side by side with Dr. John Griffin, who, as I mentioned before, uh, was a former slaveholder himself. Uh, it's very likely that Griffin uh, hired Biddy on the recommendation of his brother-in-law, Benjamin Hayes, uh, the judge who freed her. Um, and I'm going to leave it there because you've heard me talk for long enough, and, and Jackie has far more interesting things to say, but thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation was created in 2013 to provide services to current and former foster youth. Los Angeles County is home to the largest foster care population in the nation. There are 30,000 kids in the system as I'm speaking to you this morning. So we wanted to, we weren't in the beginning, we weren't really too sure what we wanted to do, but we were certain about two things. Number one, we wanted to find ways to better support these kids, particularly African-American children in the system because we are disproportionately represented. The black population in LA County is less than 10%, but yet it's 24% of the foster care population. The other thing we wanted to do, and the, the uh, early foundation was a blend of members from First AME Church as well as community members. We wanted people to really be more familiar with Biddy Mason and her life work. Uh, there's a handful of people that are aware of her existence, but the greater, the greater population has no idea who this woman was and what she was able to accomplish. So that was kind of uh, our beginning. But as we got deeper and deeper into it, we realized that Biddy Mason had actually left us a blueprint unbeknownst to her of how we could better serve these young people. So we provide services to them through our, our biggest thing is uh, academic scholarships. Although Biddy Mason was illiterate, she was very attuned to the importance of education. She sent her own grandsons and I believe one of her daughters to the Sanderson School for Black Children in the Bay Area. So we have been providing academic scholarships since about 2018. And right now we have given away just under $300,000 in scholarships. The other thing we knew from working with foster youth was that they cite, the ones who have been able to navigate the system and graduate from college, they cite two things as being critical. Number one is access to education. And number two is consistent mentoring by either a person or a group. So now that we have this lovely home in historic West Adams, we're able to provide the uh, mentoring element of support to them. And the thing that we focus on is Biddy Mason. Uh, the mural that Kevin shared with you earlier, Kevin, can you bring the mural up? Is a mural that we acquired we have a reproduction of the mural that we acquired from the University of San Francisco. And as Kevin detailed earlier, Biddy Mason and John Griffith, can you move your cursor? Um, are figured prominently in the mural and the mural was take, the mural depicts um, the smallpox epidemic, similar to what we're going through now with COVID. And that's the first thing the kids see when they come into the house. And that sparks conversation. The living room area pretty much is devoted to the history of Biddy Mason and her accomplishments. We feel that unless we all take some sort of action towards alleviating this foster care problem, we're losing a tremendous amount of potential with these wonderful young people. Currently, we have four, four students that are in PhD programs. Uh, most of the money that we award and scholarships is given to kids at master's level programs. It's not the typical stereotype that you hear about when you hear about foster care, because most of the things you hear are very negative. Um, we feel Biddy Mason would have taken this on because most slaves, including Biddy Mason, were orphans. And this would have been something that would have been particularly important to her. We are not trying to be a parent to these children and young people, but we want to be a friend. Parents are given to you friends you select. Um, and that's basically the work that we do. And being able to be on this project with Kevin and Sally 
has also given me personally um, a tremendous amount of satisfaction to learn more about Biddy Mason and the plays that I'm in the process of writing um, are really historic, it's historical fiction based on the research that we uh, are familiar with at this time. So I really, uh, Jenny, do we have any questions in the chat at this point? We do. Um, one of the questions that uh, is popping up is some discussion over uh, her name. Was her name actually Bridget or was it Biddy? Um, there seems to be some lively debate over that and whether or not um, Biddy actually took on a different meaning, perhaps as servant girl. My guess, I know Robert Johnson is on the call and he has a particular interest about her name. My guess is that, and Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we like to give nicknames to people. I remember when Reverend Murray was a pastor at First Day of Me, everybody had a nickname. Uh, there was one woman who had survived cancer and he referred to her as Miracle Whip. Um, so my, my guess is that Biddy may have been, have been some sort of nickname that was ascribed to her and maybe in more formal settings, the name Bridget was used, but um, I'm not sure. How did she sign the will, Kevin? Did she sign the will, Biddy? No, she signed the will with an X, so that won't, uh, that won't help provide an answer either. She signed the will with an X, but she was listed in the will as Biddy Mason. That was the yeah. name that she, she used. Um, and it, it's very likely that Biddy is a, a nickname from B Bridget. Um, but when she referred to herself in the records, um, she comes to us as Biddy. Uh, Paul, do you know if, if in any of the censuses that you've looked at, she's listed as Bridget or is she always Biddy? I'd have to go back and, and look at that and see. So um, but while we're doing the conversation here, I can quickly check and see if I can find anything and then I can put it in the chat. I think the 1880 census, she's listed as Biddy. Um, that was the one we yeah. just pulled up. Yeah, and actually uh, I see Amy Tanner Theriot here chiming in. A Amy is a brilliant scholar of um, enslaved people owned by Mormons. Um, look out for her book. I think it's coming out in September, Amy. Um, uh, Amy's a great source. I mean, Robert Johnson is also an excellent source. He's, he's such an informed historian of Black Los Angeles. So I guess the debate continues. Is there uh, one of the other questions that we had was, um, did Biddy ever talk much about um, how she endured um, being a slave, working, you know, being in a community of very few other African Americans around. Do we have anything, um, any records of how she felt about her her life? We unfortunately don't. We don't have anything. I mean, it, really, the only words from Biddy uh, are mediated through other sources. So we actually have a brief interview that was conducted during the, the suit for her freedom, um, uh, recorded by, of course, you know, the, the white judge. Um, uh, and then we have her, her will coming through her will. Um, but we don't have great insights into how she herself dealt with you know, withering racism and of course, gender discrimination um, and how somebody like that possibly overcame all those obstacles uh, and built the, the businesses that she did. Um, we do know though that she, um, uh, like I mentioned in, in reference to, to Sally's slides, she was able to cross the color line in 19th century, 19th century LA um, remarkably fluidly and, um, and part of the, the money that she used to invest in her first property came from visiting the prison of Los Angeles. In fact, the same prison where she was kept waiting her own freedom suit. Um, the prison was populated mostly by uh, Native Americans who were sort of rounded up on these trumped up vagrancy charges and just thrown together in mass in the prison. And basically no white doctor wanted to go visit the prison. And so Biddy took that role herself. And by taking that role, she earned money that then sort of laid the foundations for her fortune. Um, so by, by being sort of remarkably nimble, um, by uh, not holding the same prejudices that, that so many 19th century Americans did, um, uh, she, she was able to succeed. 
But, and additionally, she had a skill that was needed. And many African-Americans have been able to cross the color line when they had a skill that was needed by the general population. And I think she was tenacious enough to know how to use that in a way that would benefit and secure her family. Um, Kevin, could, uh, there was also a request from um, Mary. Uh, please show the quote that starts, if you hold your hand closed. Oh yeah, sure, Mary. Um, let me share the screen. Uh, here we go. And I think that's been um, the guiding light for the foundation. It's interesting because in our board meetings, when we have to make a major decision about anything, someone on the board invariably raises, makes a statement, well, what would Biddy do? Uh, we recently adopted a family for a year and that's based on what we think Biddy Mason would have done. Uh, so even though uh, we never met her, have no genetic ties to her, She's very much alive in this house and the work that we do. Just the whole way we got the mural. I'm sorry, Kevin, you asked me to mention that and I've almost forgot. Kevin and I co-wrote an article in the LA Times about the mural because it came to our attention from uh, Laura Voice and George at UC Santa Barbara that the mural was in danger of being destroyed. The mural is part of a collection called the History of Medicine in California. It was painted by a Polish immigrant by the name of Nathan Zakheim. And uh, it currently is housed in Tolan Hall on the UC campus, but that building is slated for demolition. Now, each one of these panels, there's a total of 10, weighs about 2,500 pounds. They're painted on, wet, on a, a wire-based frame that where wet plaster is applied. So they're very heavy. Uh, and when I contacted the university initially, they didn't really know who Biddy Mason was and certainly didn't, reckon, didn't know that she was in the mural. After a lot of back and forth between myself and one of our board members, Michael Ellison Lewis, we were able to get a meeting with the chancellor and explain to him the importance of um, the mural that depicts Biddy Mason. And so they agreed to send us a high resolution image and that's the mural that hangs in the living room of the uh, agency right now. Jackie's being modest. She's also extremely politically nimble and getting that mural into the foundation was a stroke of genius. Um, but the, the mural is still in danger. Um, it's fate yeah. or the murals, all 10 of them. It's, their fate is, is undecided right now. It looks like UCSF may uh, remove them and put them in permanent storage so nobody would ever be able to view them. Um, so, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that Jackie and I tried to do in that LA Times article is sort of grab them by the collar and say, don't you dare move this mural. People right. need to see this. This is history that's been obscured for too long. And now we have this opportunity to teach it and to celebrate it and for people to view it. Um, let's see. And those of you in the Los Angeles area are welcome to come and view it. Just give me a call because we're not open because of COVID, but we, we are open by appointment. I'd love to show you the mural and um, the Biddy Mason Center. Uh, yeah, Linda, to, oh, sorry, Jenny. That's okay. Um, I was just um, sharing a comment from uh, Linda who says that on one of the Los Angeles tax rolls, uh, she's listed as, listed as Biddy Mason and physician, which is- Yes, yes, yeah. And Jenny, and I was then, just gonna say in 1860, it is Bridget. Um, in 1870 and 1880, it's Biddy. And almost every other reference that I've seen in newspapers and tax, assessments and stuff like that is Betty, but that one 1860 census does say Bridget. Mm. Thanks, Paul. Um, Paul has done some brilliant, I mean, everybody should subscribe to Paul's Homestead blog. Um, he's got brilliant posts. They hit my inbox first thing in the morning and I always look forward to them, but he's done a really nice job in particular on um, census records in LA. And you can learn a lot about Black Los Angeles in particular from Paul. Tempe also asks, um, is there any way to get a grant or something like that to move the murals to Southern California? 
That's the, I think it's now the $8 million question, Tempe. I, I think that, that was the, the price that they cited for the cost of uh, removal. It's a great question and I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, Jackie and Sally and I approached some institutions about taking on these murals because if they had the space um, and they had the funds to help move them, um, it would really be a, a terrific resource for Southern California. I mean, I think Biddy should come home. Yes. Um, but people in Northern California understandably feel differently about that. So if you, if you have any great museum connections, please let me know. Let, let Jackie and I both know. Um, just, there was a comment about a link um, to the museum blog. So I'm gonna go ahead and just drop that into the chat. If anyone would like to um, view our blog post, um, it's very simple. It's just homestead museum, all one word dot blog. Looks like another comment has just come in. Um, from Guy asking, maybe the, uh, you two can help me get the Landmarks Department of California to give Tessa L. Kelso recognition for being the person who first began the preservation of the oldest architectural structures, st structures in California. Right now, her friend Charles Loomis um, gets permission, but Tessa was the one who invited him into preservation and passed him uh, the remaining funds and leadership when she returned back east. Mm. She was also an herbologist. That sounds like an interesting story. Um, Kevin, do you have any recommendations? An earlier question that had come in was in regards to um, appropriate uh, sources on Mason. Um, Places, um, um, books, or uh, some sort of bibliography that you would recommend on research that's been done on her life and times. That's a that's a great question. I see the name Donna among the participants. I wonder if that's Donna Graves. Um, Donna worked on the Power of Place, which which really brought Biddy's story to um, to the public in a, in a you know more probably more so than any other initiative and helped. Um, build the memorial wall we see in LA. So I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna get a couple books. Um, so The Force of a Feather is yeah. um, uh, the, probably the most complete account of the trial that resulted in freedom for Biddy and Hannah and, uh, and the others. Um, uh, and it has sort of brief biographical information about Biddy and Hannah. Um, that bookends the, the longer account about the trial. Um, this uh, really well done children's book, I, I hesitate to call it a children's book, but it's a, it's a book for young readers, um, came out, I wanna say what, Jackie, a year or two ago? Uh, yeah, about two years ago. Yeah, um, really good illustrations, really good history there. Um, and then here's the, the power of place um, that I mentioned. Um, and uh, uh, Dolores Hayden had, um, really uh, a landmark work on, um, uh, or a landmark article on, on Biddy Mason that appeared in the 1980s. Is that when it first came out in California history? Um, and Robert Johnson's on this call. Robert's got a great book on um, black leaders in Southern California. Robert, Amazon keeps canceling my order to, uh, of your book. It, it will arrive in London eventually. Um, and then I'd love to talk. Uh, and then I, stay tuned for writing from, from us, I'd say. I also want to uh, mention Eternity Street. That is a book, if you really want to understand what Los Angeles was like when Biddy Mason came here, it's a must read uh, because it provides you with all the background information with the Californios and everything else. And you know, most people don't realize that there were still Indian auctions, which were really, as far as I'm concerned, slave sales going on in the, in the plaza when she arrived. So all these things had an impact on her and the other eight men who uh, formed First AME because they were all former slaves. Can I do something really shameless, Jackie? What? <laughs> My book too okay. goes into yes. quite a bit of backstory yeah. on that. 
Um, it, uh, it's called West of Slavery, and it discusses how you know slavery reached across the continent in the in the mid nineteenth century, and and the ways in which it infiltrated California in particular, and the ways in which California politicians, even though they were living in a free state, managed to hold on to to power and to empower slaveholders. Um, and Biddy makes a cameo in the book. That's the only shame. Yeah, that's a that's a revelation, Kevin's uh, book on where they, what they intended to do with slavery and how far they wanted to take it. Uh, one of the quick questions was who had written Eternity Street? I believe that was uh, John Farriker, if I'm yeah. pronouncing the last name right. Um, I'll also type that into the chat. Uh, another question that's just come up is, are you um, able to name some of the buildings that Biddy owned during the time that still exist or maybe some of the locations? Well, one location we know for sure is the Japanese American Cultural Center on San Pedro. Um, some of the other locations, Kevin and I both and Sally have suspicions, but we, we don't have the proof yet, but that, that for sure is one. Um, yeah, and the, the, her will, um, which is held at the Huntington and a copies at the UCLA, at UCLA as well, um, does list some of her properties. Um, uh, we think, though, that she also gifted some of her properties to her grandchildren before she died, so that will doesn't capture the full extent of her property portfolio. Um, and so we, we are working slowly but surely to put together um, a, a map of Black Los Angeles and particularly the pro properties that Biddy owned. Um, you can see a, a very rudimentary version of that map on our website, um, uh, biddymasoncollaborative.com. I can also pop it in the chat. Um, and that map uh, overlaid on a, on a map of modern Los Angeles gives you a sense of where some of the major Black institutions were and where some of the major places in Biddy's life were, um, like the courthouse, like the jail where she was briefly imprisoned, um, and a couple of her early properties. Jackie, uh, there was a question from Angela uh, stating, I would love, or a comment, I would love to see more information on Biddy Mason in the Inland Empire. Um, since she was first taken to San Bernardino, do you know Hi. if there's been any efforts? Well, Angela, I'm hoping you will call me because I want to talk to you about Hannah. Um, yes, and then when Sally is back in town, uh, we're planning a trip to the Inland Empire to go through the archives. So let's definitely stay in touch. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how excited I am about this connection, Angela. Um, yeah. Uh, once I'm back from London, uh, I'd love to meet you. Another question, um, where is Biddy uh, buried? She's at Evergreen Cemetery in East LA. And that's an interesting story. Um, Evergreen at the time was like, I mean, the early pictures of the um, cemetery, it looked like the Garden of Eden. Of course, now it doesn't look that way, but many of the early Los Angeles founders were buried at Evergreen and for some reason, for over a hundred years, Biddy's grave did not have a headstone. Uh, and I, in the 60s, Tom Bradley, while he was mayor and Reverend Murray got together and felt like she needed to have a headstone. So she was given a headstone uh, through a ceremony. But um, we're not sure why she never had a headstone. We don't know if it was racism, which seems a little hard to believe with her general acceptance in the community. But Lancashire, Van Nuys, all those people are buried at Evergreen, and that's where she is. Yeah, that's a that's a mystery that stumps me to this day. Yeah. Tempe uh, had a comment. Um, it, it's amazing how many former enslaved persons throughout the country were able to obtain large amounts of property after they were freed. Uh, is her situation? something that you see common with others, former enslaved people? Well, you've got to realize who knew better the value of property than a slave. So that would have been a goal to, you know, they would have set as soon as they were freed. So it's not, I mean, it really is not that strange to me. What's strange is that we don't know about it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and when you consider what Biddy endured and survived, 
um, you could see how she got the skills uh, and got the tenacity and the perseverance to succeed in freedom. I mean, you know, surviving slavery, the length of the continent, walking about 3,000 miles as a slave, she was very likely the victim of rape. Um, she kept her daughter, her three daughters alive in slavery um, when the average lifespan of a black woman, an enslaved black woman, was about 30 at that time. Um, uh, so, and, and I think a lot of what she learned in slavery, including her medical skills, is yeah. what helped, helped build that, that fortune and freedom. Yeah, Amy makes a really good point about um, formerly enslaved people in San Bernardino. I think also uh, her driving force, as Kevin has said, was keeping that family together. Because for a child to be separated from their parents uh, at an early age, we see that all the time in foster care. They want to have family. And she was willing to do whatever she had to do to keep those girls close to her. Yeah, her middle daughter, Anne, tragically died shortly after winning freedom. Right. She made it all that way. Angela asks, uh, was Biddy listed as an inmate when she was held in the LA jail? Not in any record I've seen, Angela. Um, my, um, my knowledge of Biddy's time in the jail comes from a couple of sources. Um, actually, Paul and I had a conversation about this a couple months ago, but um, uh, we know that she was held there because the judge in the trial, Benjamin Hayes, said, with regret, I actually had the women temporarily held in the prison. Um, uh, and there are some early descriptions of the prison in um, uh, the LA Star, the newspaper from that period. Uh, and it was not any place that anybody ever wanted to be. Um, and in fact, you can find uh, complaints from a grand jury about the state of the prisoners in that prison from around the time that Biddy herself was in prison. And I think that that led uh, the city to take greater interest in the, in, in the health of the inmates, which then led Biddy um, mm -hmm. to nurse them. I'm just scrolling through to see. We've had a lot of conversation back and forth in the various chats and Q&A boxes. So I'm very happy to see so many engaged people <laughs> following our program today. Uh, Dr. Nathan Gonzalez at the uh, Smiley Library in Redlands might have more, oops, somebody else just, let me go back up here, um, might have more on Biddy Mason and also Nicholas Catal Cat Cataldo yeah, at Nick the San Bernardino um, Historical Museum. Yeah, Nick Cataldo is the one guy who knows probably more about that area than anybody else. He would definitely, Jackie uh, and Kevin, be somebody to try to uh, get in contact with. He writes articles pretty frequently for the uh, Sun. Okay. Newspaper. Great, thanks, Paul. And Amy was just saying that she wished more people knew more about Robert and Winnie Owens, um, that they were also, uh, I believe Robert had also commented that uh, they, along with Pio Pico, were um, very helpful to Biddy in terms of gathering information about locations and. Well, Robert Owens was certainly, as I'm sure he, he, he was more like a sage, I think, to Biddy because he, uh, he had purchased his own freedom and left Texas and then had this livery stable on San Pedro. He sold uh, horses to the uh, US military. So he certainly was someone that she would have valued his counsel. And then the same thing for uh, Pio Pico, because he had the history of California at his fingernails, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was, in fact, Robert Owens that took Biddy and several others in during the trial. So they were right. in prison for the duration of it. Um, they were actually housed at Robert Owens's own home. And I think that's maybe where Biddy's tutelage in, in real estate really began. Um, her daughter also married um, one of the owns boys uh, or men, um, and that really explains why the the Mason Owens family um, uh, became so wealthy. I mean, it was it was the coming together of two of the two most successful black families in Los Angeles. And 
And then her proximity, I mean, she had, she crossed class and gender and everything else in treating people. Uh, and there's no telling what information she was able to pick up along the way. I can remember as a young child, when there were black women who were domestics in Beverly Hills and nobody thought they had anything and they owned four or five apartment buildings because they were around wealth. They heard these stories. They watched how people handled their money and uh, they duplicated it. And I think to some degree she was duplicating Griffin and Wilson, Benjamin Wilson. And then women started duplicating her. And yes. She's really a yeah. pioneer um, in, in entrepreneurship and philanthropy in LA and, uh, and paved the way for subsequent generations. Angela made the uh, comment that, you know, she's just so happy in general that Black history is being talked about a lot more <laughs> nowadays. And especially, it's unfortunate how these stories, especially around women and Black women especially, tend to become lost in the historical record. Yeah. It's up to us to keep it alive. Yeah, that was one of the arguments that we were trying to make in that LA Times article about the mural. I mean, count them, there are still hundreds of monuments to Confederate generals and soldiers. Right. <laughs> and how many monuments to black female entrepreneurs are there? And that's why you put that mural in storage. And it's a, it's, it's a tragedy, not just for the Biddy Mason story, but just the general public and our awareness and our, our fund of public knowledge. Things are changing. If you want to end on a positive note, things are changing. <laughs> um, comments uh, from Tempe, our stories are important. And that things, and Angela says that yes, things are, are changing. I'm just taking a look through, seeing if there's any other, if anybody else has any other last minute questions, comments, please go ahead and type those into either the chat box or the Q&A box. I'm also gonna check on Facebook for those watching there, if anyone has any other messages that they would like to share. One more. I'm so proud that you all are um, hoping to keep Black history around. Thank you for the presentation. It certainly opened my eyes. Um, what is the most remarkable detail? Someone has asked. I'm sorry, let me go back up and see your name here. Um, what is, uh, this is from Belinda, I believe. Uh, what is the most remarkable detail you think of when you think of Biddy's personality? Uh, for me, I think it's her obvious ability to be tenacious. She moved in a, in a circle that was incredible. I mean, she would go down to Wilmington and stay at the Hancock Banning home for sometimes months at a time. She and one of her daughters, because his wife was chronically ill, uh, when, the, uh, when there was an explosion in the harbor, she was there to treat those people. And yet, and still, she still went into the jails. Um, and that, as I said before, that really is the inspiration for the work we do uh, at the foundation. I mean, yes, we have a lot of kids who are in college or in the PhD students, but we also have kids who really lost their way and can't really find their way. Um, so I think that the ability to be tenacious and flexible to me is the most important thing about her. Yeah, and related to that, I would say her, her faith in the human spirit. Um, after surviving what she survived and seeing what she saw and experiencing yeah. what she experienced, to not lose faith um, that to me is pretty remarkable. And to keep giving after so much had been taken from her. Yes. Yes. Um, another uh, comment, this is from Alan um, asking, who do you contact to make an appointment to view more on Biddy Mason? I'm gonna ask 
perhaps maybe he means, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, um, is do you know of any other current exhibits or resources, places you can go to learn more or view more about Biddy and her life? We currently have a small timeline display. Uh, I'd love if you would like to come and see it, see it, just give us a call and we can set a time for you to come. Yeah, I, I really recommend a visit to the foundation. Also stay tuned, more writing will be coming out from the grant and from us. Um, and we hope to, to make the story more widely known. Uh, Jackie, the... so sorry, Kevin. I know, I, I was just gonna say that that's really the impetus behind the grant to, to get the story out there because I think there's a hunger to know more um, and the time, it, it feels right. Uh, Jackie, Robert uh, says mysteriously, Velma Grant. Oh, <laughs> Velma Grant is someone else. I've asked Robert to do a piece on uh, for our newsletter. Briefly, she was a real estate entrepreneur that worked with Paul Williams and they built the Carver Manor Homes. Uh, it, was a, it was a housing track in South Central LA. Well, actually, I think it's in Compton. Um, her story is, there's some parallels between she and Betty Mason that I want Robert to explore for one of our newsletters. And that's, now you're reminding me, Robert, I'm gonna really be bugging you. <laughs> Kat says, I uh, love this presentation. Biddy's incredible story is a testament that folks can come from meager beginnings and accomplish amazing things. Such an inspiration. I will for sure spread the information about this recording to others um, so they can be inspired by the story. Also Thanks. got a lot of thank yous for this presentation. Um, I learned uh, so much new things that I had never learned in my 58 years of life from Frank. Thanks, Frank. Jenny, there's a question from Linda Bennett about the grocery store where Biddy had the uh, account set up. And I know, Kevin, you've been dig uh, digging into that, too. Yeah, I actually have a photograph of what we think was the store. I believe it was called B-O-D-E Grocery on North Spring. But we have a photograph of that store as part of the exhibit. Um, and, and just briefly, the background on that story is, you know, in the 1880s, LA underwent, you know, pretty historic flooding. The city was saturated. And Paul will have more details about the number of people that were driven out of their homes and lost everything during that flooding. But um, Mason instructed the this grocery store to, to, to provide provisions for the people who had been driven out by the, by the flooding. Um, and she asked the store to bill her. Right. You know, she single-handedly bankrolled a, a, a municipal aid operation. Uh, Jackie, can you please uh, name the foundation again that uh, helps the foster kids is a question from Di. The Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation. Jackie Allen was asking about a phone number to make an appointment. Do you want yeah, to I'm order? typing it. I'm typing it in now. Awesome. Okay. And I'm typing in my sales so that you'll be sure to get me. Oh, and I typed in the wrong number. Good thing I looked. Sorry. Scrolling through again to see if there's any other comments, questions. Uh, great job, everyone from Robert. Uh, love that this history is being made. Uh, this history is being presented. There should be a movie made of B. Mason's life. Any interest in writing a screenplay, Kevin or Jackie? Jackie's writing plays. Just put a screen in front of it, and you got a movie. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Donna. If any Netflix executive is on this call, yeah, <laughs> give us a call. <laughs> Oh, nice, Linda. She's got a screenplay going. Actually, I've, I've talked with a few people who are working on Biddy Mason screenplays. Um, I think the, the story is just sort of dramatically paced. Like I said, you couldn't write it better. Um, so I, one day, one day. I don't think it's that far off. I don't think it's that far off. I think there's a, because it, it's a funny thing. When we tell her story to the kids, 
you can almost see the light bulbs going on because they can draw parallels for their own life with hers. And I've heard, I've had kids tell me, well, if Biddy could do it, I could do it. You know, so um, yeah, I don't think it's that far off. Here's hoping it's not. Um, just last minute comments, questions. Angela, we all agree wholeheartedly that this also needs to be taught in schools. <laughs> yes, definitely. That's where it needs to start. All right. Um, I think we have come to the end of our presentation today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Sorry, we weren't able to get you um, up on our screen today, but hopefully we'll be able to do that again soon. Um, perhaps we can do a follow-up as we continue to learn more about Biddy and others um, who have, the, have had the same experiences that we can continue these very important discussions. Um, really quickly, I'm just going to share with um, everyone uh, that's still on um, some things that are coming up here uh, from the homestead. Let me fast forward to that. Uh, we do have a few other programs um, coming up, uh, other Zoom talks, uh, delving into other interesting LA subjects. Uh, uh, we do have also a nonfiction book club that meets usually the first Friday of every month. Um, we're hoping Kevin will be um, joining us for one of those later this year, I believe, uh, to discuss his book with our uh, nonfiction book club. So that meets uh, typically on Friday mornings from 10 to noon. We also have a program coming up on Sunday, March 6th at 2 p.m. Uh, Tiger Kings, a menagerie of problems, looking at the history of animal farms and zoos, um, as well as animal, large animals, um, exotic animals as exhibits uh, in, in and around the Los Angeles area and some of the various legislation that took place um, because of those farms and zoos. And then on March 20th, we have another guest speaker talking about the second life of Ida Addis. Paul had previously done a talk as part of our female justice series about the disappearance of Ida and um, how one of the viewers of that particular program, a attorney in um, Maryland had dived in to find um, what had happened to Ida and has come across some very interesting new research. So we'll be sharing those findings on March 20th. I'm um, just going to take another quick look. Looks like we are good to go. I want to thank Jackie and Kevin again, as well as Sarah for putting in all this time and effort to put this presentation together. Thank you all for watching. And we hope everyone has a very pleasant afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure. Yeah, really.